Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I think it was probably more difficult than usual. We're having some technical difficulties. I want to apologize for that, but we're glad you're here. Uh, we're going to start things here in another minute or two. And uh, in the meantime, we are going to start a poll to figure out where everybody's joining us from today. It'll be just a quick one and we'll be getting started shortly. Thank you. Okay, thanks again for joining us today for Gen X in Recovery. <clears throat> We're excited to get started and discuss this topic with you guys. One housekeeping note, uh, please feel free to ask any questions via the chat and we'll answer them at the end. And also, uh, we are going to be sending everybody a link to this presentation after the fact. So if anybody was unable to get in that you know of, uh, they will be able to uh, see this content, which we're pretty happy about. Next slide. Because one of the reasons is we have some really great speakers presenting today and um, they are covering both the medical side as well as, you know, our firsthand more experiential side of things. Amy Adelot is our director of new market development and Deanna Kimes is our state medical director for Ohio and they are going to take us through this content. I think you guys are going to like it. And with that, I will hand things off to Amy. Next slide. specifically on X, uh, some of the things happening as uh, Gen Xers were growing up. We're going to talk a little bit about generational trends uh, as it relates to substance use disorder, use of addiction. Um, and then we're going to dive in a little more specifically to some of the special needs and concerns that Gen Xers have and it's critically treatment providers or folks working in this population, uh, what some of the things we can do to meet them right now. And then, as we all know, uh, the disease of addiction and substance use disorder really is not out to just one generation or another. So how do we accommodate the generations um, struggling with this um, challenge that we're facing throughout the country and uh, with some discussions in Q&A? So who is Generation X? Uh, I'm Generation X. Um, I was born in 1969. If you look at the chart, though, it's the top of the slide, one of the talk about some of the statistics uh, that make up X. Um, we're an interesting generation because we are sandwiched between two larger and I was surprised to, to note Gen Xers are actually a smaller generation, but it seems like in this, as we go through this presentation, that we have size, we have some very unique challenges, um, which certainly can, can lead to. So that's Amy, can uh, you speak up a little bit? We're having a hard time hearing you. Sure, yeah. Uh, is that better? That is better, yes, thank you. That's better, okay. So we have some very unique needs um, as Gen Xers, um, possibly being a, a smaller generation sandwiched between boomers and millennials. 
But some of the things that, that I think Gen Xers are categorized with some characteristics are, you know, we tend to be independent thinkers. I think that's because we were that first generation maybe where we either single parent homes or we had both parents working outside of the home. That's where the term latchkey kid came from, of course. Many of us would get off the school bus in the afternoon, let ourselves in the house, fix ourselves a meal. I think we were just more geared to be independent on all fronts. I also think diversity was really something that was starting to take hold across this generation. Uh, we saw several different movements growing up, uh, whether those were civil rights and race oriented. Uh, we had the LGBTQ movement starting to take shape. And we were really the first generation that was, were stepping outside of our um, cultural norms or being exposed to uh, new cultural norms. And then I think, uh, and I think this is true across the board, Gen Xers, we're, we're a little distrustful of authority um, and, and really kind of nonconformist. So we were the generation that said, yeah, we're gonna do things a little bit differently. And I certainly think that uh, as we go through this presentation, we'll, we'll see that that's the case. Next slide, please. So we're talking about the decades between the 70s and the 90s. So if we look at those years, kind of what were some of the things that were going on for us Gen Xers? Uh, we were young, we're in our teens, early 20s maybe, some of us in our 30s, but, but some key things that were going on, and I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but we know that we were coming out of the Vietnam War era had a lot of guys coming back home from that event. Um, we all know some of the struggles and, and kind of the family dynamics that, that fell out uh, due to that. Also started the war on drugs campaign, and I, I know that uh, Dr. Kimes is gonna talk a little bit more about that. We saw some really incredible things. Uh, we saw the fall of the Berlin Wall. We certainly were exposed to uh, HIV as an epidemic. Uh, that, that was really scary for us, I think, uh, all of us. Uh, some of us remember the space shuttle uh, explosion. I remember sitting in chemistry class watching that and just really being in shock and, and numbed by, by that event. Um, how many of us remember MTV? My gosh, I thought that was the cool for uh, music videos, we saw a lot of new music genres coming on, hip hop began to take off, we had you know, bands like Nirvana, grunge happening. Um, and here's something to note, if we think back, the 80s culture really glorified substance use or, or drug use, if you will, uh, particularly about um, you know, that's when we started hearing about cartels and uh, cocaine was glorified. We had shows like Miami Vice that were always doing these big busts. And I mean, it really was almost sexy. And I know I mentioned that uh, whenever we were walking through some of these slides, but I mean, culturally, we were making these kinds of things that we're dealing with today uh, much better than what they actually were and the fallout of it. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kimes. So we all know that during this era, the war on drugs began. And although well-intentioned, it had been shown to have been um, actually detrimental. Although it did increase the, uh, popu the, the Americans' uh, awareness of it, although it had been more of um, a stigma or ignorance to the actual disease itself. So the war on drug, drugs apply, uh, implied that the drug users were criminals deserving of punishment as opposed to treatment. And there was definitely a stigma. In addition to that, people of color also had to deal with the racism at the time. And this is also had been publicly noted where there were a lot of um, public figures who came into the tabloids with drug use. 
although it still may have been uh, more of a glorification process than anything at the time. The Just Say No drug awareness campaign um, and the This Is Your Brain, This Is the, Your Brain on Drug uh, was, tr was attempted to be um, a well-intentioned thing, however, unfortunately, may have done more harm than good. Next slide. The uses of drugs actually changed during this time significantly. At the time, there was the, uh, the push for a new novel approach to pain, and again, another well-intentioned idea came with some severe consequences. So at the time, OxyContin was launched by Purdue Pharma, and they actually assisted with the campaign for treating pain as the fifth vital sign. And this was conveyed to all of us as physicians at the time that this really needed to be assessed and treated properly. Unfortunately, um, they also conveyed that this drug had very little abuse potential. And it became quickly noted that that, that was false information. And at this time, though, the pill mills had opened, there was a lot of extra treatment going on and as well as diversion overuse. And even if it was well, well used and used properly, unfortunately, people's bodies became dependent on the medication. Uh, from 2000 to 2009, the opioid prescription rate in the United States had more than doubled than in the previous years. Next slide. And one thing, thank you, Dr. Kimes. And, and one thing I wanted to, to point out uh, the previous slide before we move on to this one is that it, the Gen X Gen Xers at that time were young, right? I think it said that we were, you know, anywhere from 17 to 30, 31 years old. And I think with pain becoming the fifth vital sign, it, it, it created almost a, a, a mindset within our generation that we're not supposed to feel pain. And um, there's a pill for for things uh, for us, and and I and I I see that, I you know I don't know that that happened in previous generations. I don't know that the previous generations had that mindset of quote unquote pain management. Uh, so I I do think that that's something that stands out to me as, as we were looking at these usage trends. Doc, do you want to comment on that or? Yeah, I think that it facilitated a movement to where people weren't supposed to be feeling pain, that we were to be numb, numb with regards to that and truly well intentioned. It was practitioners who were truly trying to treat um, patients in the best way that they were told at the time. Right, right. So when we talk about trends across Gen X as it relates to substance use disorder, we know that what substances were out there, I mean, all are familiar with types of substances. And then with the onset of um, opioids uh, as a pain management tool, but what were some of the things that were like going on? Like what, what was happening? Um, you know, I, growing up during this time, I can tell you that uh, socially more was better. Uh, we just were a generation of overdoing everything. Um, we were uh, really the first generation who, uh, that it was the norm for us to have a college experience. Uh, it, it wasn't an option that we weren't going on to a four-year university or, or something like that. That wasn't the case in previous generations. And that whole college experience, uh, for many of us, established this um, 
go hard attitude, you know, uh, party hard, uh, try to be successful in your school, but, but just go hard at everything. And I think that, um, you know, there's some of us that, that did that and, and unfortunately felt uh, the longer term effects from that. Uh, we've already talked about kind of what was happening in, in, in it was a big thing for us um, as Gen Xers to go to movies and go to cinemas on the weekends. And, uh, you know, again, we've got media out there kind of driving this glamorization of substance use and partying hard and um, having this, this kind of um, party experience. Um, next slide. So with that, the opiate prescription uh, that had just been really out of control at that point had led to people being become dependent on it. They certainly weren't anticipating that, and neither were the prescribers at the time. So with the treatment of the as the fifth vital sign that we talked about before, um, once it became aware uh, that patients were dying because of this of overdosing, the um, the whole medical community kind of changed, and they then became frightened to prescribe opiates. They then abruptly cut these patients off of their prescriptions, and these patients who were taking it for pain and taking it as prescribed, their bodies now being used to it, were feeling sick that they weren't now that they weren't on it. So a lot of them went to using illicit prescriptions. And when that started to dry up, they actually started to use and become more expensive. They actually started to turn toward heroin. It gave them more of the um, the effect that they were actually looking for for the, the, the medication. Uh, in addition to some of the other usage trends, you know, back in the uh, 60s, marijuana had um, a high amount of use as well. However, now marijuana has started to change in its potency with um, the growing of, the mar of marijuana. Um, it has changed significantly since, um, since way, back, way back when. Currently now, too, the contamination of street substances has significantly increased. One could say it may be on purpose where these dealers are actually looking for more, um, more business. They're trying to expand their business. They're trying to have their substance appeal to more people. So we're seeing a lot more now of methamphetamine and fentanyl and cocaine mixed in with each other and uh, even in just the marijuana. So patients who had typically just used marijuana recreationally and thought that that was the safest, or, you know, pretty safe, have now unfortunately maybe become dependent on other substances. Then the other big switch though in this, uh, in the last you know, 10 to 15 years really has been the creeping in of fentanyl into the heroin supply. So um, within the last 10 years, it's really switched. So now it's very difficult nowadays to find heroin at all on the streets. It's mostly fentanyl, which is a completely uh, different pharmacokinetics. It's still an opiate, however, um, much longer lasting. And initially, people thought that that was more bang for your buck and that why wouldn't you want to go for that? So that really sucked people in, unfortunately, they um, have higher potencies. So we saw a significant higher rate of overdoses. And then once the uh, patients got dependent on fentanyl, the euphoria feelings are different than it is with heroin. It's kind of more of the negative effects and the withdrawal is significant and it lasts significantly longer. In addition, the other trend too from cocaine, which was glamorized, 
um, had quickly led to crack. It was less expensive. And the um, administration of crack is just so much faster and led to a higher abuse um, and dependency profile. Currently, and then methamphetamine started to, to sneak in as well. Um, and nowadays, methamphetamine, unfortunately, is becoming more and more of an issue um, because uh, currently now a lot of patients feel that methamphetamine isn't um, going to make them dope sick if they quit using it. Um, and that brings back to kind of circling around to the beginning of the opioid crisis. Um, that is uh, a, a good movie if you haven't seen it. Dope Sick, it does talk about the, um, the history of the opiate crisis initiation. Next slide. You know, that's, you know, that's, I, I don't know if you all saw in my bio, but I think more than any to share with you on the call this presentation today is I'm 16 years in recovery from uh, cocaine and alcohol. And as the, do as the doctor was walking through this last slide, I, I couldn't help but sit here and think about if you just look, if you're a Gen Xer and you just look at the landscape of, of substances, it has changed so dramatically from when this Gen Xer was out there and, and was a younger, younger person um, it, it's really terrifying. I mean, I think the things, I, I don't think that Gen Xers had, you know, we certainly weren't getting these kinds of messages. We certainly weren't seeing the overdoses. We weren't, it, the effects of the use have gotten far deadlier. Um, and I think that is so critically important that we continue to stress that. If, if we go back to Gen X though, and focus on some of the, the things that we're seeing uh, among us, it's scary that, you know, over the last 15 years or so, our mortality rates have been rising uh, throughout Generation X. And, and they're referring to this as deaths of despair. And these are things like suicide, hopelessness, obviously substance use and addiction issues. Um, but, I mean, these are things that are very much uh, – its way across our generation and, and and what are some of the things that are leading to these deaths of despair we'll talk more about it but quickly uh, you know I don't know if anybody on this forum lost their job during COVID but I mean a lot of us lost our employment over the last couple of years it's not unlikely likely these days that Gen Xers do lose employment which leads to a lack of health care and insurance and financial. It just goes on and on. Um, and another thing that, as I mentioned, that very first slide that we showed that that we're sandwiched between two very large generations, that puts a lot more responsibility on Gen Xers than these other generations because now we're caring for multiple generations, right? I mean, we've got aging parents that we're working with or, or, or trying to help. And then a lot of us have young adult or teenage children, We've got college, you know, to think about, we're trying to support them. So, so there's a lot of things I think that are feeding into that mortality rate. But any of you that are out there working with Gen Xers or in treatment, uh, in the field of treatment services, these are things that we've got to start to think about um, as we're working with this uh, generation. Next slide. Kind of tagging on that as well. In this generation, uh, in our age group, between the 40s and the uh, in the uh, mid 40s and mid 50s, is when too we start to see a lot more um, comorbidity conditions, a lot more patients with illnesses that have to um, also be taken into account. Uh, and especially since if they had used substances or in their earlier years, during that period of development uh, in their brain, it was a very critical time. So when they had 
used when they were adolescents, then it actually shaped and changed the, the development of their, their mind, and, which is unfortunate because it can have lifelong lasting effects. So in addition to the comorbidities too that we have to deal with, here are some of the different use disorders that we here at Brightview also um, treat. In addition to opiate use disorder, which is, uh, is pretty much our, our largest population, we have a significant amount of alcohol use disorder in this population. And, uh, and then stimulant use disorder is, a, is kind of following up there in the third uh, highest category. We don't want to forget about tobacco use disorder. Um, this, these, these numbers seem a little bit low, and that is because the data that we probably pulled for this is more of the, the use disorder as opposed to a t um, the nicotine dependence, which is a different um, diagnosis code that we use. So if they, they may not meet the use disorder criteria, but um, a significant amount of patients with use disorders of any kind have tobacco use as well. So we, as practitioners, don't want to forget about the tobacco use and the significant health repercussions it has. And we at Brightview also address that primarily or technically on every visit as well. We try to add that in um, to help them with that as well. Next slide. So in addition to treating those, we have to really address the stigma and you don't, you don't want to treat the person again like a criminal or like they have done anything wrong. And some still unfortunately think that treating with medication um, is trading one drug for another. Unfortunately, some of these patients' families, whether it's their parents or grandparents or children, um, significant others, they feel that they're just using another drug. And unfortunately, we try to, we, we're, we're trying to overcome this stigma by increasing public awareness that this is a medication like it would be for something like high blood pressure or diabetes and, um, and how the medication differs. Although there are similarities, obviously it's an opiate for opiate use disorder, the um, MAT that we prescribe. However, uh, some patients still deal with that stigma, even in groups such as um, uh, like alcoholic, non Alcoholics Anonymous and others, um, they may still have that stigma even among the group members, unfortunately. And, you know, with the, the brain changes, not only during adolescence that we talked about can make lifelong changes, but also even if they started using substances at a later age, the brain chemistry still changes such that the brain gets used to those extreme highs and the brain actually functions to downregulate that because they're having this overwhelming amount of substances like dopamine and different receptors are downregulated, which means that the brain doesn't um, manufacture as, as many um, and just as a as a safety mechanism. So unfortunately, the brain then, uh, the person still feels like they need more and more of the substance to get the desired effect. And when you take that away, then that extreme low that the patient is feeling contributes to the withdrawal, but also, you know, the depressive theory, uh, symptoms and such too. And our treatment here at Brightview tries to, in all treatment centers in general, try to treat not only with, um, the medication, but we feel that definitely the counseling goes hand in hand. That is, there's definitely a component necessary for both the behavioral aspect and with the medication. And group therapies are really important. We provide that treatment as well. And still encourage patients to do outside groups. Uh, and we already talked about the uh, the COBRA, high likelihood of comorbidity with medical diagnoses. This population often doesn't have primary care providers. They're often mistrustful of physicians or practitioners in general because some had become dependent on this because of a practitioner. So they have they definitely have that fear of going there. 
in addition to like feeling that that was, you know, it was their fault, which rightly so sometimes it was. And also just the stigma that they feel going into offices and having to divulge this information is, is very stressful for them. So we really want to try and help them along with that in a non judgmental way. Next slide. As, as treatment providers, how can we help? How can we help Gen Xers who are struggling with substance use disorder or the disease of addiction? I think, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, I think that we really have to dive deep into understanding this generation uh, and what are they bringing with it uh, in addition to their need. Um, one of the things I think we, as, as we talked about Gen Xers having, uh, you know, maybe some financial stresses as it relates to aging parents and then young adult children, I, th I think we've got to make sure that we recognize those financial stressors and not make that a barrier to them getting help. Um, and so in addition to breaking down stigma, it's making sure that uh, we're able to provide quality care to these folks um, who, quite honestly, and I mean, I was just talking about this the other day, somebody said something about retirement and I kind of laughed and I was like, yeah, I probably will work till the day I die. I mean, this is a generation that we're not sure uh, if we're going to have the means to comfortably retire. Uh, we all have high hopes. But I mean, the fact is that this is uh, a generation that uh, we haven't had a good handle on our finances. Uh, and we've seen a lot of uh, stock market challenges and, and maybe didn't get educated on the importance of saving and investing. Uh, we've got obligations to multiple generations. I mean, this is some really thick stuff. I mean, so the question is, when we're treating Gen Xers, you know, we kind of look beyond do you have health insurance or what kind of health insurance do you have? I mean, you've got to understand that even though we may have health insurance, I mean, there are some other things that may also be lending to our challenges. Um, the biggest one being like, are we ever going to be able to stop working, right? So, I mean, just that one statement right there kind of encapsulates uh, some of the things that as uh, treatment partners, providers uh, need to think about. Next slide, please. So in addition to understanding those challenges, I think um, another, a few other areas that, that we can all help is, uh, and I think we do a great job at this, uh, at Brightview is, you know, we always hear meet the patient where they are, meet the patient where they are. And the fact that we're, you know, taking apart a generation and really looking at it, I think says a lot that we do want to understand a person where they are mentally and emotionally. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that play into a person struggling with substances. Some of it is related to childhood. Some of it is just some of the adulthood responsibilities that we're facing. But really meeting the person uh, and, and kind of wrapping yourself around them uh, is, is certainly a first start. Um, eliminating barriers. My gosh. I mean, I think that's why you have Brightview and a lot of communities that typically have not had treatment providers or quality treatment providers is we've said, look, there's a lot of places across our region and country that do not have quality substance use care. Uh, and these are usually smaller communities. Um, and with the smaller communities comes a huge need for education. Uh, going back to the stigma that Dr. Kimes was referring to, a lot of times in the communities that Brightview's trying and making a footprint in, uh, in addition to 
getting, you know, getting people the help they need, we have to go out there and educate the city leaders and, and people to understand that the, the world of addiction and substance use disorder that we're facing today is life and death. It, it goes way past partying and going hard and having a good time. Uh, we really got to wrap around every aspect of this in order to make a difference in our community. Um, and then routine screenings, I mean, I think about this. I mean, if, when I was out there seeing substances and, and falling deeper and deeper into my disease of addiction, I wasn't really worried about going to the dentist. I really wasn't worried about what my blood pressure was or going and getting a physical. I think just to, you know, starting those conversations with uh, Gen Xers, because we're at that age now where, like, in our minds we still think we're young, but our bodies, particularly if there's been a history of substance use disorder, are maybe feeling or are at risk for some long-term effects. And so getting uh, you know, that person moving toward some routine screening I think is really key as well. Did you want to comment on that, Dr. Kimes? I just... Um... No, the only thing I wanted to, rec uh, to recognize though too is I don't want people to think that all is lost, all hope is lost, that the patient is destined to be afflicted all of their life. That um, I know I had mentioned earlier that the patient's brains are very, um, that they haven't completely uh, developed in adolescence and the, that drug use can have, could have, uh, uh, high use you know, drugs had, could have uh, changed that. But I do want to mention that the brain is very, uh, uh, very amazing. It has uh, the wherewithal to improve. Um, that it really, one of the definitions uh, is neuroplasticity, where it actually has the ability to um, change the neural um, networks and to uh, actually grow and reorganize, and uh, it uh, the function can be significantly restored. And um, that time is an average 18 months for um, a patient after. Um, having sobriety that it is, you know, we want to install hope into patients too, that they're not going to be, um, that, that there's no, there's no hope that uh, the brain is definitely a, an amazing thing that we can uh, have them look forward to improving. Yeah, it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Next slide. And so for those of you on the call today, um, Again, substance use addiction does not discriminate across generations. We, we're we talking about Gen Xers today, but there's not a generation that hasn't had uh, some impact from the disease of addiction. So how, how do we, how do we help all generations and continue to, you know, fly that flag that recovery is possible and no one else has to die from this disease? And really, um, we've got to break down barriers to care and access. And again, at Brightview, I think we have built our model based on treatment on demand. People can just walk in off the street and start treatment that day. I think there needs to be more of that. We've got to expand programs to address some of those special categories of people struggling, for instance, uh, expectant mothers or new mothers um, and, and really, uh, and again, with this comes uh, a need for education. Um, in our communities, if we've not enacted the Family First Prevention Act, um, that's something that we need to be talking to our leadership uh, in our communities about. That particular act, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I know that it was developed in order to keep children uh, in, the, in the family home where there may be 
behavioral health or substance use issues because what we were find you know what science and and data tell us is that removing these kids and putting them in foster care sometimes creates uh, exacerbates the trauma so to speak so check into that family first prevention services act in your community we've got to continue to to really really work with our uh, criminal justice, our justice system partners. Um, you know, jail is not always, and incarceration is not always the solution. As a matter of fact, uh, for those folks that are currently in that environment and are there because of the disease of addiction, uh, we, we've really got to work with our justice system to explore other options and make sure that they are receiving treatment of some kind while they are imprisoned and then looking beyond their their you know upon release what are things that we're doing in our community and alongside the justice system that's going to help that person continue on their path of recovery and then uh to being a productive member of society uh, and then always uh you know ongoing uh, research into this, uh, this world that we're in today uh, that maybe doesn't include opiate, uh, opioids as a, as a possibility or, or, or non-drug you know, treatments. So thank you, next slide. And the other thing I wanted to mention too, in regards to uh, what you were just talking about, Amy, is that when patients are released from uh, jail, or any kind of incarceration, they have now um, lost a lot of the tolerance to the the drug use that they had previously been um, accustomed to. And when they are released, a lot of times they may feel that they um, can do what they had done before. And that leads to unfortunate uh, high risk for overdose on uh, release from incarceration. Same goes for detox programs. Um, again, well intentioned to detoxify a patient off of the substance, then um, if not placed on a, a, a maintenance medication, sometimes these patients then feel that their battle is over and it, it, um, then it's just a, a behavioral aspect. But in all reality, we've seen such uh, so much better results when a patient is um, sometimes need the maintenance medication to keep them ha from having those cravings and the urges to use even once that detoxification and the withdrawal period's over with. And uh, that could be sometimes, you know, a year, a year and a half, a couple years. And But some patients though, because they're in the, um, they have had generations of substance use before them, um, may unfortunately struggle with it for for a long long time and need to be on um, maintenance for uh, maintenance medications and even just in, in treatment pr program in general for um, many many years but it's all on a case-by-case -case basis and people are different and we like to tr uh, treat people um, differently as they as as is needed the other thing that i would really hope that is um, a push is the um, use of and, and having Narcan in everybody's uh, disposal. So um, when patients that I see that don't even have opiate use disorder that have other disorders, um, I tell them all that I would love to prescribe them Narcan um, just so that they may save somebody's life and um, discuss with them how to use it um, and, and notification of EMS always. But if we could have everybody um, have Narcan on them if they felt that 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 stigma again is not that that patient deserve that person deserves that or you get so many shots at life and then you shouldn't have any more. That's that's really a sad thing that I'd love to see change and to have Narcan available on every person so that if if anybody sees somebody um, along the street in the gas station in the grocery store, um, that they could maybe save somebody's life. And here are a couple of quotes from these generations from uh, staff at 
right view here, and one of the Gen Xers had given this quote uh, that unique challenges include growing up in social en en environment wherein celebrating in excess was normal. This harkens back what Amy was saying, and hard living had taken its toll on us physically. Uh, we were so busy taking care of our parents or our children that we put ourselves last on the help list, if at all. Next slide. This one from a baby boomer. Growing up as a baby boomer, alcoholism, addiction, and treatment were treated with shame, embarrassment, and a strong misconception that addiction is a failure of character and willpower. Hippies and burnouts had drug problems, and the weak and immoral became alcoholics. This made for an environment that was not conducive to discussing, let alone admitting you had an issue. And a quote from an, another generation from millennials, they see um, legal highs, unfortunately deadly highs. This was um, a quote from a millennial Brightview staff. I see why millennials struggle with substance use disorders. Cheap legal highs are, are suddenly available in stores and the ease of access at a time when they have even less understanding of what may be in illegal substances increases the odds of a negative outcome. Next slide. And then lastly, Gen Z, um, a lot of, you know, peer pressure is general, uh, in general is worse due, of course, to social media, uh, constantly seeing people post selfies, living their best lives while drinking or using drugs, puts pressure on Gen Z to live up uh, to the standard and gives, gives this, gives them a fear of missing out. No other generation had this level of peer pressure. Gen Z have also been educated to avoid drugs and binge drinking, but too many ignore this with feelings of invincibility. That's so true. I have a Gen Zer, and it's so true. Next. Okay, everybody. First, I want to just thank you for, for joining us today. We do have um, some, a question or two and wanted to let you all know that we will be sending you a link to the slides as well as the video um, to everybody that, that managed to navigate past the technical issues we were having as well as the other registrants. So everybody will be getting that as, as follow up and we appreciate that. Um, for the first question we have is, and I'll let, um, Deanna and Amy fight over, over who takes this one, but uh, why is it so important that providers like Brightview focus on breaking down stigma? Well, I think it goes back to what we were, what, what one of the baby boomer quotes were, is that mindset that people are, who are struggling with the disease of addiction are immoral, have poor character, have no desire to do better. Uh, those are simply untrue. I mean, we are, we've got to continue. I mean, it's been proven that uh, addiction is a disease and at Brightview, we treat it as a disease. Um, and so I think that until we get, you know, we've got to get rid of that stigma because, and because that stigma today, stigma today is killing people. I mean, that's the bottom line. But I'll defer if Dr. Kimes wants to chime in on it in the few minutes that we have left. Yeah, definitely that's an excellent question because still a lot of people still believe that this is not an actual disease, that they feel like a person should be able to stop. And while some do still acknowledge that there's withdrawal, the actual basis of a disease is something that I would love to get out to more people that um, we would hope that more and more people believe that it is truly a disease. There's a biological basis for it. Um, we've talked a little bit, not very much, uh, because it's a it, it's it's overwhelming evidence that shows that the neurotransmitters are changed in the brain function, and um, it is truly a biological process. And it should be treated um, as another medical condition. It's not just, um, quote, in your head, unquote. 
um, but the, it is truly a physical thing. And um, we all know that physical dependence can happen even if a person doesn't have a use disorder. So that when they take medications that the body gets used to, such as opiates, such as alcohol, such as benzodiazepines, um, the body, it doesn't matter who you are, um, what, what background you've had, or if you were prescribed it um, or taking it illicitly, that a body becomes dependent on it and you will have physical withdrawal from it. And some of those are life-threatening. So um, these patients, unfortunately, don't seek treatment often because of the stigma. So uh, I look for a day when it's all, um, when most everybody's minds changed and it is uh, understood as a disease that is a chronic disease, not just um, a, 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 an ailment in passing. Okay, well, we appreciate uh, everybody's time here. We just wanted to remind everybody that, uh, you know, for any of our referral partners, uh, there's obviously three easy ways to refer new patients. And we also want to let you know about our next virtual forum, which will be a lot easier to access. I can guarantee you that. And it's going to be on Thursday, February 16th from 12 to 1, same day of the week, same time. And uh, we're really looking forward to, to this topic as well, much in the way that we address the Gen X segment, you know, looking at, at Black Americans in recovery. It's even more um, multi-layered and complex. And we're excited for our, our subject matter experts to be speaking to that with you guys here in a few weeks. So um, please look for that. And we'd love to see you at that one as well. And again, just want to thank everybody for spending time with us today. We'll give you a few minutes uh, back to your day. And uh, again, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Amy.